can check what's wrong with that, no problem. But there is your normal uh, cock curve as you. Okay, so the recording is live, and um, I think we see we've got four more minutes to go. Well, we've got two minutes left. What you're going to do is you're going to do your initial. Let's go back just for a second. You're going to do your initial design, which was pump sizing. Okay, hey Bill, it's 12 o'clock on our side. So I think that you can start with your introduction and uh, share your screen. And then I will just be on the background to manage all the questions and that if something comes in for you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, perfectly from my all right. side. All right, good. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen uh, and do my introduction. I just wanted you to get a look at what I, I look like. Uh, so if we uh, get stuck in the same elevator someday, you'll know who I am. Uh, let me go start to share my screen. Can you see my slides okay now? Perfectly. All right. So uh, I'm, uh, we, we're, SPED is developing a tradition of offering uh, outreach to, uh, so, you know, through selected hosts. And in South Africa, we're working a lot through Compute. I'm very grateful for their support of our uh, outreach efforts. And uh, today's seminar is going to be about pipe route checking tips and tricks. So let me let me get start to get into the uh, presentation. And uh, my, I am I am William Beasley. 
Uh, I'm the retired executive director of SPED. And I'm doing a lot of the outreach because I was uh, there when uh, a lot of the content was developed that I'll be showing you today. So uh, let, let me get into it. I'm going to start out with a little introduction and then I'll talk about first uh, about avoiding mistakes and uh, and uh, uh, in 3D pipe routing. Um, I will this it's hard to decide which is first, which documents you have to have on hand when you do routing and then checking, uh, and then how to avoid mistakes altogether. So I often interchange these topics. If I have not uh, a little out of sync on that, please forgive me. But uh, there, um, once you get all the correct documents together, the number one thing you want to do is try to not make mistakes and introduce mistakes in the model because uh, bad data or destroyed data is the worst kind of industrial accident you can have because in a, in a 3D electronic world, it's very hard to find these errors once you've introduced them. But that's what this seminar is going to be about. So I'm, then I'm going to go on to talk about how to find mistakes in 3D models, what techniques we have that we know about so far. Of course, I'm always adding to this list. So if you have suggestions at the end, I'd be welcome to hear them in the discussion. And then uh, how you track progress in a, in a pipe model checking, and then go over a little bit of takeaways, and then maybe we can get some good discussion from the people who've attended. Uh, personally, um, I count my uh, success in the quality of the questions I get. So um, if I don't get any questions, I feel like I've talked over your head and I feel bad about it, uh, but I, I prefer to have really good questions at the end. If you'll hold them to the end or close to the end, I'd appreciate it. Sometimes people raise their hand because uh, they're not seeing my screen and I have to fix that, but uh, but I prefer to get uh, questions at the end, but questions is how I gauge my success. So uh, what this content came about because SPED studied a number of checklists for our new PPD level two course on piping quality assurance. And I'll talk about what that program is. Uh, in, as part of that, we identified six principles and several techniques for checking. And I, this talk is gonna focus not on all the techniques that might apply, but on some of the lessons learned for pipe routing. Uh, last time, last year I spoke at, uh, at this venue on the general, uh, applicability and the general principles and where they apply and this is focusing on pipe routing. SPED has a four level certification program. The level one is uh, are, are you properly trained for routing pipe from nozzle to nozzle including the rack and and pipe and uh, pumps and and minor equipment but mostly inline components. Um, and uh, then level two is more advanced. We want you to be able to organize and quality assure your pipe routing. And that's the focus of that uh, level two uh, content. Level three is a kind of a senior uh, level. That's where we get teach uh, equipment layout for quality piping. It's a very advanced uh, topic. And level four is lead uh, piping designer process piping designer. That's where you manage, estimate, and assure full scope work. Now we qualify people through direct testing and acceptable experience. Now in the level two area, we had a test in place since 2015, but we didn't have any uh, educational content. Uh, so we developed about 20 hours of uh, video content trying to teach people how to uh, assure piping, uh, piping designs at all level. And then uh, today I'll just talk about routing. Uh, we looked at multiple checklists and how to articles. And I was the lead author in distilling the first course. All my content was reviewed by the PPD advisory committee uh, before I recorded them. And uh, we did get some lesson learned. We got some general principles uh, you can apply to checking, uh, and then identified some useful methods that uh, that are there. And the key thing, the key takeaway, 
is that all these uh, principles and all these uh, techniques can be taught to other pipers. So um, it's, it's no use uh, just describing it as, a, as an artistic thing uh, if you can't teach it to other people. So let's talk about the principles and methods of piping assurance. And I, I'm a big one for putting stuff on a page. So let's uh, talk to the single diagram uh, in, in the course. Of course, I go into a lot more detail. But uh, the first principle is that there's inherent geometry and topology in piping, uh, that uh, pipe is a physical solid. You can, clash, you can check for clashes. Uh, it's connected and aligned. Uh, these are things that you can check for uh, in the software and have nothing to do with the design. It has to do with the nature of pipe. Uh, then uh, we can check for the execution of design intent. This is the uh, uh, increased detail from the PNID to the piping layout. A lot of data is brought into the uh, piping layout from other sources, uh, but um, but uh, mostly we are uh, adding detail and refining the PNID into another level of detail. And then uh, this data brought in from other sources has to be preserved and, be, and brought in correctly, like tags and things like that. And so in this new level of detail, we have to make sure all the data is correct that we brought in from other sources. In addition, there's a lot of recording of design intent. Uh, when we lay out the pipe, it's not just the piping model, but we add a lot of detail that is to instruct others who are going to follow on and use that data, uh, particularly fabrication and, and construction, but also analysis and other, other disciplines. Then uh, we have to pay attention to the traceability to approve data. Nothing can go out the door unless it's client approved. So we have to preserve traceability. And uh, so uh, that's another design uh, responsibility that we have to execute. And then finally, there's, in order to preserve the uh, usability of the model itself, we have to adhere to CAD application and uh, project uh, conventions. You know, we have to structure the data so it can be used by the CAD system correctly and reported correctly by the CAD system in other renderings and uh, generated content. So these are the six principles that we ad identified. Now, uh, so with that in mind, when it's time to gather documents, some documents has to be at hand in most cases because those documents that are being refined or included in the pipe routing or instructs the piper have to be at hand so that he is executing all this information. And I'll give some examples in a minute. And these could include the P, they must include the P and ID but also client material specs and standard details, vendor required details, and nozzles, specialty items, that data has to be at hand. But other information shows on the routing, is repeated on the routing, it's not the data of record, uh, but you have to have access to that information so you can double check that you have correctly entered the data. This is things like equipment data sheets and so on. Uh, and then as part of that, uh, traceability to uh, to approval, you have to recheck the versions you're using, make sure that your routing is uh, in line with the latest approved versions. So I, I remember that uh, uh, Cecil B. DeMille, Ten Commandments moving, uh, the, the Pharaoh uh, said, so let it be written, so let it be done. So here's an example of instructions. Uh, these are actually instructions to the uh, assembler uh, of, and the piper. They want a spectacle blind, but in the P and ID, they're telling you how the blind is to be set in normal operation. So these are the kind of instructions that are in the P and ID, but instruct others. Also, um, the client uh, will give you a uh, piping spec, material spec. Normally, they'll specify it. You may create it yourself, but part of that spec will be a branch table. 
which is an instruction to the piper as to how he's to create branching uh, out of main lines to uh, uh, sub lines, to branch lines. So uh, with these documents in mind, uh, the first thing is to avoid mistakes altogether. So how do we do that? How do we avoid mistakes? Well, first of all, there are conventions in the CAD system, in the host CAD system, for how to route lines, how to make connections, what a nozzle should be, what properties it should have, how components are created. And most of those CAD systems have macros that will create and edit those routes and add components and make sure all the required data that the CAD system wants is in the, in the uh, uh, model. But in addition, the company and the client may have conventions and customizations that they use to coordinate with their uh, uh, other systems, their, their corporate systems. Or when they generate data or render reports, they want this data reported along with uh, the piping material. So it's your responsibility as the pipe router to understand all these conventions before you start the job, because it's easier to put it in correctly than to add, come back and add it later. Uh, and, it, you know, for example, the biggest challenge when you absorb data from another source is this tremendous quality assurance burden you have to make sure all the conventions that are used in the, uh, the newly acquired data fits the conventions that are required on the job. So then you have to find all the instructions that uh, are in all the sources and uh, highlight that if, if you have to, but it's the responsibility of the assigner of those documents to assure that the piper understands every piece of instructor. It's not the piper's responsibility to find everything. It's the person who gives the document, who assigns the document to the piper. They must make sure that the piper sees every piece of instruction. So uh, also, the piper is responsible for reading and understanding the customer standards that apply to each line. And of course, this is the corporate advantage of a contractor that works for a client frequently because they know what the client uh, has in terms of corporate standards and specs. So, um, but you must understand that. And it's, it's a good read. It's a quick read. If, you, if you've read them before, it's a quick read. You look for unusual things uh, that they're requiring that they prefer. Um, then when you incorporate other prior work, like uh, say a scan uh, or another model, you have to encode and check the material specs in the component library and make sure that that data is uh, fully operational and capable for the CAD system that you're in. For example, in a spec where you have uh, tie-ins and uh, other obstructions that you want to check against, you have to make sure that they are correctly represented in the CAD system, that the uh, scan data is rectified uh, and uh, everything's uh, scaled correctly. That's your responsibility. And of course, there's the old model, you can't inspect in quality. You have to fix it now and don't let that data propagate. Now, <clears throat> I like to tell people that the, P and I, the PFD is a question and the PNIDs are an answer. Uh, the process flow people, the process people say, here's what I want to do as a process. And the engineers, all the engineers respond with a PNID that says, yes, I can do what you want and here's how I'm going to do it. So the PNID itself is a tremendous set of instructions to the piper. It's the engineering answer to this question. Uh, you know, and uh, so a lot of people follow on with that and look at that PNID for uh, 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 a lot of a lot of the plan. The PNID is the general plan of the plan. And uh, of course, as a piper, you're one of those people. But a lot of people look at the PNID uh, for instructions. Now, when I say incorporate uh, outside data, when you get a general arrangement, uh, for, say through scanning, and most people now do get general arrangements through scanning uh, and go ahead and look at other documentation and enhance 
uh, the general arrangement. You're going to do a lot of particular things that are designed for make it CAD usable. You don't want it just a cartoon in the background, but you have to uh, locate the nozzles that are um, required by the design. These are the tie-ins uh, that uh, you must obey. And then you have to add all the CAD compatible features like tag, size, spec, insulation, connection point, out vector. It depends on the CAD system you're using, what, what requirements are, are necessary. Of course, most CAD systems have a nozzle generation macro that lets you put in the, macro, uh, the nozzle with all the required data. But of course, you have to position it according to, say, a point cloud uh, and so on. And then there's all the required and excluded pipe route pathways that are implied by other data. These are the uh, required, excluded, not over, not near, not under, uh, not, you know, uh, there are all the uh, do's and don'ts of the pathway that you have for the routing. If you're working to a rack, you'll probably be assigned a zone on the rack that you're supposed to use and you have to get to the zone and so on. And all that has to be either understood or actually explicitly marked in the, in the uh, general arrangement. And then you're gonna reconfer all the field data constraining the design, the origin alignment and scale, uh, any uh, point clouds and solids for class detection. Um, the recommended approach, of course, is to model it, but store it apart and reference the model, not include it in the design, but keep it separate. So if you uh, update it or get a better scan or find an error, you can uh, update that model and uh, everyone can reference that new information. Now, uh, fortunately for piping, there's a lot of inherent geometry you can check for. Uh, there's a physical geometry that's a solid, you know, can't, can't super clash with other things. Uh, it's got a topology requirement, it's connected, it's aligned. Uh, then there's also convention errors um, that you're missing data, you forgot to enter something or you entered it incorrectly. So, uh, never delay noting a possible issue uh, in the model. I know as a pipe stress engineer, I checked a lot of digital models because I had the rendering of the model and I could find the errors in rendering and tell the piper that there's an error in the model that caused the error in rendering. So uh, I would often uh, email a screenshot with the line and location to the responsible party. Uh, that email didn't go away. It uh, could be reviewed, should be reviewed as immediately if you can, but then, uh, you know, close to uh, issuing a job, you go back to those emails, make sure you've covered everything. And uh, it's the responsibility of the error finder to tell the piper all the details he needs to locate and correct the error. Here's the kind of example you get uh, in, a, uh, in a model. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Navisworks model, and here's an off-center unconnected pipe. You can spot it physically, or it shows up in a pipe stress model, but here's, this is just an error. And here's something I questioned, turned out to be correct, a five inch over 25 foot offset in a, uh, in a uh, pipe route. In fact, that was correct. But uh, it, it just, there's just something about, did this render correctly? Why is there a listed offset when most piping is orthogonal? And you ask that question. I got an answer that, yes, in fact, it was, that was correctly modeled. Here's an, another example of an inherent geometry problem. Um, you know, this, this has nothing to do with uh, route other than the fact that it's routed incorrectly and the geometry itself is violated. There's another pipe clash in the red circle down here. You can see, this is a typical, uh, you know, hard, hard clash. Let me try to get. Uh, um, here's a couple of lines in a desuperheater that were not. They were routed up to where the desuperator is, but they're not connected to anything. So this will not report correctly. And this is something that has to be corrected in the model. 
And I saw this also in Navis works. Here's a, here's a uh, lack of connectivity that showed up in the pipe stress bottle. You run the bottle and suddenly uh, you get terrible displacements and no stresses. What's going on? Well, it's because the pipe looks correct before uh, stressing. And then you see the displaced uh, bottle, you see that the pipe in fact is not physically connected. So you can logically as an analyst go in and correct this in the pipe stress bottle, but it's also necessary for correct, for out correct reporting that it be corrected in the digital model. So uh, one way to find mistakes is to do a rendering. An ISO generation is something not missing, not showing up in the bill of materials. Uh, in the Caesar model, like the one I just showed you, is anything missing or disconnected? You look in the bill, bill of materials, is anything missing that should be there? That's the responsibility of checking the ISO. So for example, here's a trunnion that actually is in the physical model, but did not report in the ISO because of the way it was modeled. So when that data was corrected, uh, let me see if I can get up here. Here's the missing area. And when it's corrected, it shows up as corrected. And it's all a question of making sure the data in the CAD model is encoded correctly. And I'm gonna somehow get back to my screen. Uh, when I do a presenter, I have a presenter screen, and now I'm somehow not able to get to my presenter screen. Well, let's go back. And here's another example here is uh, obviously physically disconnected. This is a specialty item that's, that is in the model, but is not coded correctly and does not report correctly. So, uh, the other mistakes you have to check is uh, design mistakes. Uh, you have to do a from to check with the PNID. Now, most CAD systems today will uh, encode the PNID and guide the routing itself from the PNID. So you, you're told what nozzle to start at, what nozzle you're going to, if you think of it in terms of a flow, and that from to is implied. Uh, if you're incorporating other data, you have to do the check manually, but there is a one-to-one -one correspondence required uh, in the piping model with a PNID. And also, you want to cross-check data with source records. That's data that's appearing in the model, but actually is it's not the data of record. So uh, you cross-check that as well, and uh, also make sure you have uh, carried out the instructions to uh, you and then instructions you're encoding to other people. Um, and a lot of people uh, do these checks using model viewers and I'll illustrate some of the techniques that people use to make these checks. Uh, actually model viewers, if they're encoded properly are very, very helpful in finding these mistakes because of the way you can select and zoom and so on and rotate. Uh, I remember that I asked a lot of pipers, uh, have you run a class check? And they said, no, we don't run class checks anymore because it's so easy to pan and zoom and rotate the model that we can find all the classes just by inspection. And so that's, that's how new tools have eliminated the uh, formality of uh, running a comprehensive class check. So uh, the motto here is fix it now. Don't let a mistake be shelved for consideration later, because then you have to document it and go back and find it. It's better to fix it now. And most for most pipers, it's just an easy fix. You don't even have to document it. You find it, you fix it, it goes away for good. So here's an example. In the uh, Navis works, you can select by spec if you've encoded the model correctly. And other viewers can do this. You can select by spec. Well, here's an orphan uh, that had the wrong spec. It, it's, it shouldn't be showing up because we're only looking at lines with one spec, but it has the wrong spec in another model. So uh, it shouldn't be showing up. It's not part of the line. Uh, and uh, that's an easy fix, but that's how you can detect it. And of course, I mentioned the from to checking that we want every component to show up in the in the in the documented model in the right order, and so uh, that's that's uh, easy 
uh, check to do visually, but you have to walk through the model. And then you want to make sure all the incorporated data is correctly encoded, like tag numbers, like uh, instrument names, control valves, and so on. Typical assemblies. You want to make sure that's all correctly documented because it has to be rendered later. Also, uh, the other instructions to Piper are best practices. And here's a couple of best practices that uh, actually occurred in a plant where the valve stem is in a, uh, a walkway under a pipe rack. There's pipe routed through the walkway, which is uh, unfortunately was actually what the client had done. It's not a recommended practice because you have to drive around it. But plants have burned down by hitting pipe stems that uh, that uh, go out into a walkway. So that's not a good practice. And here's another example where the valve stems are, are oriented under the route of the pipe. That's not recommended. You easy fix in practice in the field. It's easy to fix in design so it, uh, it, it could render correctly. So now also you're you're also in the business of forwarding or in, or providing instructions to other people and these fabrication and assembly instructions are normally generated on the isometric so uh, you want to implement these instructions in the model so they'll render out with the isometric they're never lost anytime you render the isometric those instructions come out and uh, here's a typical p and id instruction uh, i don't have a good example of uh, of pipe instruction, but they're all over the place. Typically, a P and ID will do things like uh, vent this to atmosphere, drill a hole here. These are instructions to the fabricator. Uh, slope the line. That's instructions to the piper. You know, uh, do not pocket the line and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, instructions you'll carry out, and a lot of instructions you'll carry forward. Now. Um, we have to track our progress through the model and the uh, classical and still uh, prevalent method of finding all the major components in the plant is the P and ID. So most people track their progress through the model by just markups to the P and ID uh, and a P and ID annotation. And this is because it's a most comprehensive, most comprehensive view of the plant and uh, Contains all these, uh, contains many instructions to the piping designer. It's easy to mark it up with highlighter pens. But you also have to look at change orders because remember, you have a responsibility to show traceability to approval. So you have to review all the change orders, and those are your responsibility to make sure you've uh, implemented them all. And then version notes you want to annotate, uh, uh, make all the annotations you need to make sure that you. Uh, uh, document all changes and make them visible and in, in, in reportable conditions. And uh, project managers usually have procedures on how to publish uh, changes and version notes. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the watchword here is working is an activity, but milestones are accomplishments. So uh, in every almost every case, there is some uh, cumulative act where where there's a release of some kind that's when all these uh, instructions and, and errors are corrected and, and uh, released on the project. Of course, the classical markups, uh, you know, yellow for OK, red for revision, black for comments, orange back checking, blue for designer only, uh, uh, green to remove, and so on. This, there's a convention, and here's one that's been provided to me by Hatch. Uh, it's it's uh, only necessary that you follow the convention on the project and be consistent. And again, I mentioned that you uh, have to prove traceability of all design data to uh, client approval. And uh, because he is the owner, he is the responsible party uh, for the final operating plan. So everything you design, he has to embrace and, and take responsibility for when the design is completed. So he wants to approve, he must approve everything that you issue. You can design it, but he has to approve it. Um, 
And then you have to prove that everything you've shown is traceable to that information. So there's uh, constant uh, status terms as built is how the plant's actual physical and functional aspects uh, are at a specific point in time. But as approved is data that's been approved by the client. As specified is data approved, previously approved data provided to the engineer by the client. And as released is data officially provided to anyone. So these are common status terms that uh, people use. Um, also, uh, there's documentation in the revision blocks of, uh, of, the, of changes made. They're summarized here, but also people use uh, uh, change revision clouds in the, in the design to show people uh, what's been changed. So uh, the takeaway here is uh, prevention, prevention, prevention. You, you don't want to be finding mistakes in the eventual model. You want to have procedures in place and practices in place that prevent mistakes from uh, being entered in the data and, and also being uh, corrected and not propagating into the further design. But we do uh, checks. Uh, if you find a mistake in a in a in a design check, that's the worst location, because the checker is the last uh, the last uh, barrier to uh, data going out and actually being seen by the client, and worse, being actually used by somebody else. So if a, a checker finds a mistake, that's a that's a uh, cause for concern and should be a uh, educational moment for the designer. Designers should not let mistakes get to a checker. They should uh, take responsibility for their mistakes internally. So uh, make sure that you've seen all the instructions in the design and make sure that everyone who's assigned instructions and data to you make sure you understand what you have received, that you're an understander of it, like a P and ID. Make sure you understand everything in the P and ID. Uh, to avoid those mistakes, uh, you know, you want to automate your work as much as possible. And remember the efficiency now of electronic uh, models is to uh, automate as much as you possibly can. So what that means is that every designer is a, has to be a power user. Every, every piece of data entered now is going to be used by many other people. So uh, it has to be right uh, electronically because it's rendered and repurposed so much. So fix it now. Never let the sun set on the mistakes. Never, you know, just don't let it occur. Fix it now. Get it out of the system so it's uh, not, not there for other people to act on. And then document and document and document what, you, what you're doing. If you want more information on SPED and this, uh, the uh, master set of videos that teaches more about these checking techniques, and I don't have time to go into now, uh, please contact Catherine Vanderwald, who actually is located in South Africa. And so uh, she's very accessible to you, much more than I am here in the US. Uh, but she'd be very happy to help you uh, uh, get this video get the full video content for yourself or enroll people in our courses. Uh, with that, I'd be uh, happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, hey, Bill, thank you. I see that there is a question. Um, can you access the chat on your side? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Show conversation. Is that it? Okay. Um, just go scroll a bit down. It's from Tim Ivory. No, I don't have a checklist to share with you today. I will share the notes with you. Uh, and uh, if we have your email and documentation from Catherine, you'll be getting a uh, certificate of attendance that shows the uh, uh, that you've attended and you will be getting the notes of the slides that I've just sent out. Thank you, Tim.
Thank you. Okay, any, uh, anyone else have a question? Well, I guess I've dazzled you, okay. Uh, yes, um, yes, um, you can duplicate it. Uh, if, uh, remember that, uh, that uh, the general, when I say general arrangement, I'm talking about the model. I'm thinking of the model of the equipment from which the Piper routes. But the but that model would be rendered and there'll be instructions on the rendering to construction. Uh, a lot of those, uh, you have to decide as a modeler whether you want it, to, want it just to render with the general arrangement or you want it to render it with the P and ID because a lot of people render fabrication P and IDs to the fabricator and then generate fabric assembly of P and IDs for use in the field. So you have to decide where that instruction uh, will show and how it's to be shown. And, and as far as duplication, um, you have to also make the decision where the data of record's going to be. Uh, wh where the source of that instruction is going to be. And it's its first use is, is often in the general arrangement or in the pipe routing itself. Okay. I think um, if if we do receive any other questions, I still have the chat live on my side. Um, but I think that was a great session, Bill, and we can conclude the session and the recording will be made uh, available to everyone who attended today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind attendance. and I appreciate it. OK, fantastic. Have a great evening, Bill. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.